In the history of human flight, we are obsessed with the visible forces. We talk of lift, that mysterious suction that pulls a wing into the sky. We talk of drag, the invisible hand of the wind holding us back. We celebrate the breaking of the sound barrier, an event so violent it shatters glass and shakes the earth. These are the battles we can see. These are the battles we can hear. But there is another war, fought in the silence of the laboratory and the deafening roar of the test cell. It is a war against a more primal enemy, heat. From the moment the first internal combustion engine sputtered to life, engineers have been locked in a deadly dance with thermodynamics. To fly faster, to fly higher, and to carry heavier loads, we must liberate more energy. We must compress air until it screams. We must burn fuel until the combustion chambers glow like the heart of a dying star. But energy is a double-edged sword. For every ounce of thrust we gain, we pay a tax in thermal violence. As engines grow powerful, they do not just push planes forward, they turn into furnaces. Inside the heart of a high-performance gas turbine, the temperature climbs to levels that can melt the very alloys designed to contain it. The challenge is not merely generating this power. The challenge is stopping the machine from consuming itself from the inside out. This is the story of that invisible barrier. It is a story of oil that boils, metal that creeps, and the desperate struggle to keep a hurricane of fire contained within a few millimetres of steel. It is the story of the transition from the piston age to the jet age, a pivotal moment in the 20th century where the rules of engineering were rewritten. And at the centre of this storm, standing quietly amidst the blueprints and the cigarette smoke of post-war Britain, was one man. He was not a pilot, he was not a politician, he was a chief designer. His name was Lionel Hayworth, and he was the man who taught the fire how to breathe. To understand the magnitude of Lionel Hayworth's task, we must first understand the world that forged him. The late 1940s in Britain was a time of austerity and ambition. The Second World War was over, one on the wings of the Spitfire and the Hurricane, powered by the legendary Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Rolls-Royce was not just a company, it was a national institution. It was the standard bearer of excellence. But the technology that had won the war, the piston engine, was reaching its limit. The future was the gas turbine, the jet. Lionel Hayworth walked the halls of Derby with the weight of this legacy on his shoulders. He was a man of the old school, meticulous, obsessive, deeply grounded in the mechanical realities of the past. He had cut his teeth on the liquid-cooled engines of the war years. In those machines, heat management was a plumbing problem. You had radiators. You had water jackets. You pumped coolant around the cylinders to carry the heat away, much like a car engine today. It was heavy, it was vulnerable, but it was understood. But the new directive was different. The commercial airline market was born, and it demanded something impossible. The early pure jets were too thirsty. They burned fuel at a rate that made transatlantic passenger travel economically ruinous. The airlines needed a middle ground. They needed the fuel efficiency of a propeller driven by the raw power of a jet turbine. They needed the turboprop. It sounds like a simple hybrid. A jet engine at the back, a gearbox at the front, a propeller spinning in the wind. But mechanically, it is one of the most complex machines ever devised. And thermally, it is a nightmare. Haworth was tasked with leading the design of these new machines. His first major success was the Rolls-Royce Dart. The Dart was a centrifugal engine, rugged, tough, a tractor of the skies. It powered the Vickers Viscount and became the workhorse of the post-war recovery. But the Dart was relatively low powered. It could be cooled by the sheer volume of air rushing through it. But the market, as it always does, demanded more. More speed, more payload, more range. Rolls-Royce committed to a new engine, a beast of a machine. It would be called the Tyne. It was designed to produce over 4,000 horsepower, nearly three times the power of the early darts. But as Haworth and his team would soon discover, when you triple the power, you do not just triple the heat. The relationship is not linear. It is exponential. They were about to hit the heat barrier.
Let us descend into the physics of the problem. Why is heat rejection such a catastrophic issue for a high power turboprop like the Tyne? A gas turbine works on a continuous cycle. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. The compressor sucks in air and squeezes it, raising its pressure and its temperature. Fuel is injected and ignited, creating a high velocity stream of gas that drives the turbine wheels. In a pure jet, most of that hot gas shoots out the back to create thrust. But in a turboprop, you are trying to extract almost all of that energy to spin a shaft. That shaft runs forward, through the heart of the fire, to a massive gearbox that drives the propeller. This creates a terrifying thermal environment. The turbine blades are bathing in gas temperatures exceeding 1000 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, just a few feet away, the gearbox oil must remain below 100 degrees to function. If the oil gets too hot, it begins to oxidize. It creates carbon deposits, coking, which clog the delicate jets that lubricate the bearings. If the lubrication fails, the friction generates even more heat. It is a runaway thermal event. The bearings seize, the shaft shears, the engine tears itself apart. Hayworth looked at the early data for the Tyne and realized they had a fundamental problem. It was not just about keeping the engine cool while it was flying at 300 miles per hour with sub-zero air blasting into the intakes. The real danger was on the ground. It was a phenomenon known as heat soak. Imagine the engine running at full power during takeoff and climb. The metal of the turbine casing, the discs, the nozzles, thousands of pounds of steel and nickel alloy absorbs a colossal amount of thermal energy. It becomes a heat battery. Then the pilot lands, they taxi to the gate, they cut the fuel, the engine stops spinning. The cooling airflow vanishes instantly, but the heat remains. With no air to carry it away, that stored thermal energy radiates outward. It seeks equilibrium. It pours from the hot turbine section into the cooler compressor and gearbox sections. The temperature of the casing spikes. The stagnant oil in the lines begins to boil. Rubber seals designed to hold back oil turn brittle and crack. Wiring insulation melts. This was the enemy Howarth faced. It was a silent, creeping enemy that attacked when the engine was sleeping. To solve it, he couldn't just add a bigger radiator. He had to rethink the entire architecture of the engine's skin. He had to redesign the airflow not just through the engine, but around it. Today, a modern engineer at Rolls-Royce sits in a climate-controlled office. They look at a 4D monitor. They run computational fluid dynamics, CFD, simulations that track billions of particles of air. They can see the temperature and pressure of every cubic millimeter of gas before a single piece of metal is cut. Lionel Hayworth did not have CFD. He did not have supercomputers. He had a slide rule, a drafting board, and the intuitive genius of his team. But how do you design cooling airflow when you cannot see the air? How do you know if the cool air is hugging the hot casing, or if it is separating, creating stagnant pockets of vacuum where heat can build up? Hayworth's approach was tactile. It was physical. He moved the laboratory outside, to the windswept test beds of Hucknall. He employed a technique that seems almost medieval by modern standards, yet it remains one of the most effective visualisation tools in history. Tuft testing. Howarth's team would take the engine cowling, the nacelle, and cover it in hundreds of tiny, distinct pieces of white wool. Each tuft was carefully glued to the metal surface. Then, they would mount the engine in a wind tunnel or run it on a test stand with a massive propeller generating the airflow. They would film these wool tufts with high-speed cameras. It was a mesmerising sight. When the airflow was smooth, laminar, the tufts would lie flat all pointing in unison like a school of fish. This meant the cooling air was attached to the surface, scrubbing away the heat effectively. But in other areas, the tufts would go wild. They would thrash, spin and stand upright. This indicated flow separation. It meant the air was turbulent. It was detaching from the metal. In those chaotic zones, the cooling was failing. Those were the hot spots. Howarth spent hours analysing this grainy black and white footage. He was reading the wind. He saw that the intake geometry, 
the shape of the mouth of the engine, was critical. The Tyne needed a chin intake, a complex scoop located under the propeller spinner. If the lip of the intake was too sharp, the air would tumble over the edge during takeoff, starving the cooling ducts. If it was too blunt, it created drag. Haworth iterated the design relentlessly. He wasn't just an engineer, he was a sculptor. He shaped the aluminum cowling to coax the air where it was needed. But external observation wasn't enough. They needed to know the pressure inside the beast. They built manometer banks. These were massive wooden racks holding dozens, sometimes hundreds, of glass U-tubes filled with coloured fluid. Each tube was connected by a rubber hose to a tiny hole drilled into the engine casing. When the engine roared to life, the fluid levels in the tubes would dance. A drop in fluid level meant low pressure, a suction zone. A rise meant high pressure. By watching these dancing liquids, Haworth could build a mental 3D map of the pressure distribution inside the engine. He could ensure that high pressure cold air was constantly being forced into the low pressure hot zones, creating a continuous purging flow. It was a masterclass in empirical engineering. They didn't model the world, they measured it. While the external cooling was being solved by wool and glass tubes, a more desperate battle was being fought inside the turbine itself. As the Tyne's power targets increased, the temperature of the gas entering the turbine exceeded the melting point of the blade material. This seems like a physical impossibility. How can a machine operate when its components are hotter than their liquid state? The answer lay in a radical concept that Haworth championed. Film cooling. If the metal cannot withstand the fire, you must ensure the fire never touches the metal. Haworth and his team devised a system to bleed off a fraction of the compressed air before it entered the combustion chamber. This air was cool, relatively speaking, perhaps 300 or 400 degrees Celsius, but compared to the 1,100 degree gas stream, it was freezing. They routed this cool air through the hollow center of the engine shaft and up into the roots of the turbine blades. But here was the stroke of genius. The blades were not solid. They were hollow, honeycombed with intricate passages. And on the surface of the blade, barely visible to the naked eye, were rows of microscopic holes. The cool air would rush up the inside of the blade and squirt out through these holes. But it didn't just blow out. The holes were angled to lay the air flat against the surface of the blade. This created a thin, insulating blanket of cool air, a film that coated the metal. The superheated gas from the combustion chamber would rush over this film, never actually making contact with the alloy beneath. The blade was flying inside its own protective atmosphere. Implementing this on the Tyne was a manufacturing nightmare. Drilling holes into mnemonic alloy, a material designed specifically to be indestructible, required new tooling, new techniques, and immense patience. If a hole was blocked, that part of the blade would melt instantly. If the hole was too big, you wasted valuable pressure and lost engine power. Haworth's team had to balance the thermodynamic efficiency of the engine against the structural integrity of the blades. It was a compromise measured in thousandths of an inch. By 1957, the theory was sound. The tough tests showed smooth airflow. The manometer banks showed positive pressure in the cooling ducts. The film-cooled blades were installed. But in aviation, theory is nothing without endurance. The engine had to pass the type test. This was the ultimate trial. The Rolls-Royce Tyne was strapped to the test bed. The schedule was brutal. 150 hours of operation. It would run at maximum continuous power. It would simulate aborted takeoffs. It would be slammed from idle to full throttle and back again, subjecting the casing to violent thermal shocks. For the engineers, these were sleepless nights. They lived in the control room, drinking stale tea, eyes fixed on the gauges. Oil temperature, steady. Turbine gas temperature, high but stable. Vibration, negligible. The test simulated the worst case scenarios. They shut the engine down hot, letting the heat soak set in then fired it up again immediately to see if the bearings would seize. They injected oil heated to dangerous levels to test the cooling capacity of the new radiators. The engine roared on. When the 150 hours were up, the silence was deafening. 
But the work wasn't done. The true test came during the strip down. Mechanics disassembled the engine piece by piece. They laid the components out on white tables. Howarth and the certification authorities walked down the line, inspecting every surface with magnifying glasses. They were looking for creep, the stretching of metal under heat and centrifugal force. They were looking for bluing, the telltale discoloration of overheated steel. They were looking for cracks in the casing caused by uneven expansion. The parts were pristine. The airflow management system worked. The complex chin intake captured the air, the internal ducting rooted it over the hot spots, and the film cooling protected the core. The heat rejection system, that complex web of oil, air and metal, had successfully pumped millions of BTUs of waste energy out into the atmosphere, leaving the engine safe. The Tyne was certified. It would go on to power the Vickers Vanguard, the Canadair CL44 and the Transall C160 transport. It became known as one of the most reliable turboprops ever built, a machine that could operate in the freezing winters of Canada and the baking heat of the African desert without complaint. Lionel Hayworth eventually retired. The drawing boards were replaced by CAD terminals. The slide rules were replaced by calculators and then by computers. But if you walk onto the tarmac of any modern airport today and you look closely at the engines hanging beneath the wings of a giant Airbus or Boeing, you are looking at Hayworth's legacy. Look at the intake. Its shape, optimised for airflow at all angles of attack, is a direct descendant of the tuft-tested cowlings of the 1950s. Look closer at the turbine blades of a Rolls-Royce Trent engine. They are marvels of single crystal growing technology, but their survival strategy remains unchanged. They are riddled with laser-drilled cooling holes, shrouded in that same protective film of air that Hayworth helped pioneer. The power of modern aviation, the ability to fly across oceans in hours, to lift hundreds of tons into the sky, is often credited to the power of the combustion. We worship the fire. But the fire is easy to create. Any match can start a fire. The true genius of engineering lies in the control. It lies in the cooling. It lies in the discipline of the airflow. Lionel Hayworth taught us that an engine is not just a box of explosions. He taught us that it is an aerodynamic structure, inside and out. He taught us that to master the heat barrier, you cannot simply fight the heat with force. You must negotiate with it. You must guide it, channel it, and wash it away with the wind. In the grand archive of aviation history, Lionel Hayworth is a quiet chapter. But every time a turboprop winds to life on a remote runway, Every time a jetliner climbs steeply into the thin air, safe and cool in the heart of its inferno, his work is there, silent, invisible, and absolutely vital.